I want to talk to you from the depth of my heart here on why America is great. God bless America and why he does bless America. I'm going to start here, and I'm assuming that all of you have one of those brochures in your hand right now. And I'm going to start reading here by the, the very first number one, right up here at the top. America is considered the world's greatest nation today. This is due to God's multiple blessings on us because, because. Uh, before I go any further here, let me just say this. If you don't think we're blessed, you ought to start looking around. Yeah, just yesterday, just yesterday, I came up to the church here and I drove, I took my car, I usually take my little push cart, and do it, but I took my car and drove around over here where they were having hands for healing. They were passing out the food. And uh, the uh, church here feeds, I, I don't know, something like 1,700 people a week or something like that. Maybe that's even less than that. But I'm just trying to tell you here that, uh, that, um, that this church provides food. I drove over there and, man, they want to start giving me all kinds of food. I said, no, no, no. I just, I just, I said, okay, I'll take a snack. Okay, I'll take some grapes. I'll take some cherries. You know, I can snack on those in the office here. You're like, no, 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 no. I don't want it. And in fact, they gave me some and I went and had to take it back and get said, no, no, just keep these. I, 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 I can't deal with all of this. Cars were lined up, folks. They were loading up cars. And I remember seeing this, and I do that all the time, and these people are so precious and so wonderful. All of you that are in that group, God bless you. You don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to know you have the highest respect from me. You are giving to the people that have need for food. They wouldn't be coming there. All right, let's go ahead and give our hand clap to them. Amen. And some of you are in here even tonight. And these people come in there and they receive food. And I said to Sister uh, Annie Weaver, I said, boy, I said, America is blessed, aren't they? And she said, Brother Myers, we are so blessed. I said, we cannot, we cannot give it away. It's like we've got more than we can almost give away. She said, we had two trucks to come in just today and unload food here for us to give out and disperse to the people. Now, I'm telling you that to say this is America, and God has blessed us abundantly in America. And if there's no other reason for you to praise the Lord and thank the Lord and glorify his name, whether you're in your home, whether you're in church, or just driving down the street, praise the Lord, worship God. Don't, when you're driving and you pray, don't close your eyes. Just keep your eyes open. But just thank God and praise the Lord and say, God, thank you for America. Thank you for America. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further with that. I want you to look at the very next sentence that I've got. This is due to God's multiple blessings on us because, and I'm going to talk to you about some of these very briefly, very quickly here. A, our forefathers acknowledge God. That's one of the reasons God has blessed America. Our forefathers acknowledge God. The pilgrims, for instance, uh, they were or originally from England. They were people that were being persecuted because they were a very righteous people, wanted to live, uh, live for God with all of their heart, and religion had become so uh, carnal at that time. So they went to Holland. And when they got over into Holland, they were there and they heard about what was going along across the ocean over here in America. You, you know the story back in the 1600s. And America had already been visited by the Spanish. And, and they had been visited by the French. You had gone up the, uh, the Mississippi River and done a lot of, you know, they, they looked for furs and things. Fur, they were fur traders. And uh, then you had other English colonies along the East Coast. But the pilgrims said, we want to go to a place where we can settle down, put our roots and live and make that our home and so they were beginning you know plymouth plymouth landing where they came from england and the mayflower came and you know the story massachusetts and they established this nation on the basis that they would have the right to worship and god would bless them and they could serve the lord out of the goodness of their heart 
and so forth. That was only the beginning, and so it has gone from there. Now, uh, I want you to look with me in Psalms 33, if you would. Psalms 33, 12. I'm going to talk to you about this a little bit, and I'm going to move on into some, into some deeper things here. If you look in Psalms 33 and 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You don't have to go any further than right there. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's right here in Psalms. If a nation will make God their Lord, God will bless them. It's there. It's stated in the word. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I'm going to go to Psalms 115 and verse 13 and verse 16, 13 through 16. Look at this verse. This is Psalms 115 now I'm reading. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Notice that. I will bless. I will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and at earth. Verse 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. All right, so here's another scripture telling us here how God will bless anyone on this earth in a nation or country or people who will make God their savior. And one more verse of scripture, Psalms 89, look at 15 and 16 if you look at this with me as well psalms 89 and it says here in the 15th verse blessed is the people that know the joyful sound they shall walk O lord in the light of thy countenance in thy name shall they rejoice all the day and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted and so these nations praise the lord are blessed they have been blessed and God has blessed them because they have said, we will make America to be a nation that respects and honors and loves God. Praise the Lord. Now, there's another reason why God has blessed America. Look at B here. Look at B. And it's simply this. America has been kind to the Jews. God has ordained that any nation or people who are kind to the Jews will be blessed because in 70 AD, God destroy, had destroyed, had Jerusalem destroyed and the Jews scattered throughout the whole world because of their rejection of Jesus Christ and their, their intentions to still live in that Old Testament and not wanting to live into the New Testament. And so the Lord said, because you have rejected the Messiah, your savior, and you have rejected them, you'll be scattered in all the world. That was all prophesied, all in Matthew, Matthew 24, uh, Luke 21, uh, Mark 13. It's all in the scriptures there where the Lord said, I will do all of this. And so the Bible tells us here that uh, these people here will be uh, judged in that fashion. Look at Genesis 12, 3. This is a scripture about uh, treating the Jews fairly and right. God will always bless anyone who blesses the Jews. I remember reading uh, Winston Churchill's writings years ago. And he was a guy who would sit up in the middle of the night. And he'd sit in the middle of his bed in England. And they were in World War II fighting in Germany and in the Axis, as they called them. And we were the Allies, the Axis and the Allies were fighting. And uh, they got word that the, the Nazis were really, really mistreating the Jewish people terribly, putting them in prison, killing many of them, making slaves out of them, all kind of crazy things. Winston Churchill, in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, he wrote this himself, and I read it. Uh, he was sitting in the middle of the night in his bed, and he was studying and reading, and he read the scripture in the Bible where it says, because, and I can show it to you if I had time, I don't have time tonight to do it. Because you have chosen to help my people, I will bless you and ye shall be victorious. 
you shall be victorious. And he said, when I read that, I knew God was speaking to my heart and he was telling me we were going to be victorious because we were concerned about the Jewish people. And he said, from that day only, he said, I knew we would win the war. And then that's whenever bombs were falling on London and air raids coming and all kind of things happening. And he would walk through those streets and they'd all say, Prime Minister, what's, what do you think is going to happen? You think we're going to make it? He said, stick with the plan, guys. And boy, what a plan. Boy, what a plan. He'd always say, stick with the plan. And boy, what a plan. Just like he had a great plan. But he was so confident they were going to win. And they did. We did. We and they, were, British and us, were on the same side. Well, anyhow, I'm just pointing out to you here that the word of God is so true. Look what it says here in Genesis 12 and 3. I will bless them that bless thee. I will bless them that bless thee. He's talking to Abraham here. This is uh, verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, which was Ab- Abraham's name before God changed it to Abraham. And he said to him, now this is verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee. Look at that. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so there, and I could give you many scriptures, many scriptures throughout the Bible, all through the, the law books, also all into the, the uh, prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so forth where God promised that he would bless the people who would be good to his people whenever they were scattered, especially in countries and so forth. I won't go any further with that, but God has promised to bless us because we're kind to the Jews. Let me go to number to see here. And this is where I'm really going with this, and this is what I want to spend most of my time here tonight. Look at C. It was God's divine plan to use America to evangelize the world. Folks, don't forget this. It was God's plan to raise up nations and to use nations that he might reach out into the world to evangelize the world. Now, I'm going to go way back into Daniel here in just a moment. And I'm going to show you this in the scriptures and we'll come back into the New Testament again. But I want you to know that God hasn't just blessed us because he likes us. And he hasn't just blessed us for because we've regarded him. That's one reason. And we regard the Jews. And that's another reason. But he's also blessed America because America has been concerned about the people in foreign places that needed to hear the gospel. That wasn't Washington that was doing that. This was the church in America that was doing that. And God blessed and has blessed America because... We have been mindful of what is needed over there on the other side. Amen. Uh, I'm going to uh, have you go with me, if you would, to the book of Daniel for a moment. I've got some stuff to show you here. Go to the book of Daniel with me. Let's see here. Before I do, let me do, let me go here. Let me go this one first. Look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20. This is confirmation scriptures that it is God's will that the world be evangelized. Matthew 28, 19, and we'll read 20, 19, 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name. If you've got, if you've got your Bible, put a ring around the word name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We know the name of the Son is Jesus. Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name. The name of the Father is Jesus. The Holy Ghost, the name of Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, if I am now with you, but I shall be in you. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. These are not three separate and distinct persons. They are three separate and distinct, or three separate manifestations of the one God. I won't go any further than that. Everybody understand that. All right. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you in lo. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I'll never leave you. He said in one place, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Praise the Lord. I'm with you always. And so he has promised that he'd be with us and that we were to go into all the world and, and, and teach all nations. That's God's word and that's God's will for us. 
Now, I'm reading another scripture that's over here in Mark, and this is Mark's rendition of the same thing Jesus said at that time. This is the way Mark says it in 16, 15. And he said, speaking of Jesus, and Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Look at the 17th verse. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. And that's for sure it has happened. They shall speak with new tongues. And that has happened. And that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is a prophecy here of the Holy Ghost falling when it had not yet come down, fallen as it did on the day of Pentecost, which was just 40 days later. Now, I want to move on a little bit further here because I want to get into the book of Daniel here and show you where all of this came from. Here is why God has blessed America, where we are today in prophecy, and God's hand is upon this nation. Number one, our forefathers were mindful of God because there has been righteousness in America in regard for the Lord. He has blessed America. And because we have been good to the Jewish people, God has blessed America. But there's another reason for it. And I want you to go with me then to the book of uh, Daniel. And I want you to go to chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31. Daniel 2, 31. Now, everybody hang on to your bonnets here. You with me? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. This is when Daniel had been captured by the Babylonians. In 606 B.C. had been taken to Babylon. He and the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were close friends, all four of them. And they were put in the king's palace. And they were going to be made where they would be wise men who would help to guide the king, instruct the king, and what they were doing. They were just young teenagers at this point. It's believed that they were around 17, 18, maybe even 16 years old. But they were just young people. Let's say 17 and so they went into Babylon. And when the Lord had finally put Daniel and them there, he gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar tried to get the wise men to tell him what the dream was. And they said, we can't tell you the dream until you tell the interpretation. He said, tell, tell, me, tell me what the dream is and I will tell you. You tell me what the dream is. Then I'll believe you when you say you'll tell me the interpretation of it. And so they said, we can't tell you the interpretation. We don't know the dream. He said, well, you don't know the interpretation if you don't know the dream. So Daniel and the three Hebrew children, as they were called, the three friends, they started praying and seeking the Lord because they were going to go, they were going to be killed along with all the other wise men if they didn't come up with the answer. And the Lord gave it to Daniel. Daniel had a dream. He dreamed the same thing that King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and gave Daniel the understanding of it all. And Daniel went before the king, said, King, don't kill nobody. I got the answer. I'm going to tell you what you dreamed. I'm going to tell you what the interpretation of the dream is. And here's what Daniel said in chapter 2, verse 31. Everybody with me? 2.31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This, a, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron and his feet part of iron and part of clay. What possibly, this is an artist's drawings of it, what possibly what Daniel saw, you say, Brother Myers, what's this got to do with God blessing America? Just stay with me. This is possibly what perhaps uh, Daniel saw something like this. And he said, he said, I saw... Uh, a head of gold. I'm going to read that again. Verse 32. This image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms were of silver. You can see that part of it. His belly and his thighs of brass. His legs of iron. His feet, part iron and part of clay. Now, this is what he saw. And, uh, and he went on to say here, verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet. 
that were of the iron and the clay and break them to pieces. Notice the stone hit the image on the feet. Then was the iron at the bottom, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff, the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone which smoked the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, what Daniel saw was these empires that came to, to pass. Let me have you look over verse 39 with me in your Bible. Verse 39, and that's on your, in your notes there. That's the next thing that you see there. Uh, we're in Daniel uh, 2, 35 and 33, 31 and 35. Now we go to verse 39. Read 39 through 40. Everybody's still with me here. Just hang on. I got something good to show you. The very last six words in verse 38. He says to King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel's still speaking here. Thou art this head of gold. He's interpreting now, telling him what the interpretation of this image is. Thou art this head of gold. In other words, the Babylonian empire, you're the head of it. You're the head of gold. Look at verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth, one behind the other. Verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Verse 41, and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. The kingdom shall be divided. Notice here the legs are divided. Feet are divided, the toes are all divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay. Now, this is what he's talking about. Uh, before I go any further, let me show you here an advanced picture of this image. And this is what he said. He said, Thou art the head of clay, thou, thou art the, the head, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the Babylonian Empire, and he represented the head. The Media Persian Empire was the one that followed. They overthrew the Babylonian Empire later on and became, the, became a great and a mighty empire in that part of the world, and especially uh, east of there, the Mediterranean Sea, and into the Mediterranean. The Grecian Empire overthrew the Media Persian Empire, the Alexander the Great. That's all in history. And they overcome that. I got dates that I could give you on all that. It's not necessarily right now. But that represented the, the belly and the thighs of brass. The iron here the, represented the Roman Empire. And then the feet represented this empire, which is the time of the Gentiles, at the very end where it is today. Now, let me read something to you here. I'm going back to Daniel. Everybody's still with me. You say, barely, Brother Myers, barely. <laughs> Hang in here. Look at, uh, look at verse... Uh, let me read verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with mire clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. This is the seed of men shall mingle themselves. It says, let me read 42 and 43 together. As the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, as though the kingdom seemed partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, that is the people of this, of this time, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, or the seed of men shall mingle themselves with themselves. They shall mingle themselves. In other words, if you reverse that, this is, this is brought out in other translations. So they shall mingle themselves, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In other words, this is going to be a time at the end here where there's going to be a lot of nations, customs, nationalities, uh, people, 
all over the world that's going to be mixing together. They'll mix together, but they will not fully mix together. There's going to be a separation, but they'll still be mixing together. And they'll have the strength of this iron here. They'll be a strong. And this is what's developing in the world today, where that these nations are beginning to sort of come together. But they come together in a fragmented fashion, in a way in which they are fighting each other, warring each other, yet they're trying to get united. And this is what has been happening here now for decades. Now, I'm going to read a little further. Look at verse 44. And in the days of these kings, in the days of these kings, speaking of this entire body of right here, this whole time, in the days of these kings, all of not just the feet, but all of it. Look what it says. Whereas in the days of these kings, verse 44, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Now, what he's talking about here is the establishment of the church. Now, if we were to lay this down sideways, if I were to lay him down sideways like this, and this was a timeline here, in this Roman Empire here, in this Roman Empire, Jesus came. Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he established this heavenly empire or this kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven on earth in his day. You say, Brother Myers, nah, I don't believe that. Now, let me give you a scripture then. I want you to go with me, if you would, to uh, I want you to go with me and uh, yeah, go to, to go to Matthew three and one and two. Matthew three one and two. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. This is in Jesus' ministry time now. John the Baptist is preaching. And saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of heaven is here. That's what John was preaching. Now, later on, when John was put in prison, talks about Jesus. I'm going to the 17th verse of that same of the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, same thing. John uses kingdom of uh, God, and I think it is a lot, and Matthew and uh, others use the kingdom of heaven. Now, same thing. They use the same illustrations, but they use different words there. Now, I'm just pointing out to you here that the kingdom of heaven, when it was established, was God's church on this earth. God's church on this earth. Praise the Lord. Uh, let me see if I can find the right scripture here for you. All right, let's see here. I better get back to my notes here. <laughs> Find out where I am. Let me have you go back over here for a minute. And I'm going to show you here where we are. What God showed Daniel. God shall set up a kingdom. That's what we were just talking about, Matthew. This kingdom is the church. Now look in John 3 and 3. John 3 and 3. Praise the Lord. This is Jesus now talking to Nicodemus. Everybody still with me? We're talking about the kingdom of God on earth now. John 3 and 3. Jesus said, answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, I'm jumping down to verse 5 here in that same chapter there in John, John 3, 5. Jesus answered, 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, notice that water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, praise the Lord, was being referred to here. Now, I want you to look over here in Luke. Luke verses 17, chapter 17. Luke 17 and 20. I'll get back to Daniel in a minute. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. I'm giving you all of these scriptures to let you know that the kingdom of God that Daniel referred to in chapter 2, that God was going to set up, one day and then when all of these kings would come and one of those times he was going to set up the kingdom of God in the earth. And I'm showing you here, Jesus said it, John the Baptist said it, Jesus said it again here, these Pharisees, that the kingdom of God is within us. It is within our own hearts. Now, one other verse of scripture here to, uh, to show you here how, how solid this is. This is in Romans and, uh, 14, 17. If you don't have any other verse, but this one, this is enough. Verse 17, 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You got it? So if we're in the Holy Ghost, this is the kingdom of God. What I'm trying to point out to you here, folks, is that the kingdom of God that Daniel prophesied would be set up one day upon the earth during that time of those kings, and I'll get back to that in a moment, that whenever that be set up, it would be the church of, of the living God set up in this world. John said it, Jesus said it, Jesus said it again to the Pharisees. The book of Romans here declares it as well, that it's the Holy Ghost in us. So, the church in this world, the church in America and all over the world, wherever it was started out in Jerusalem, wherever it is, it is God's kingdom on this earth. And it's not a kingdom that there's somebody with a diadem and somebody with a big hat and somebody sitting on a throne. None of that kind of stuff. He said it's going to be within you. Praise the Lord. This is God's kingdom on this earth. And God is very much very interested in his kingdom, praise the Lord. And the Bible tells us that this king, this kingdom shall last forever, shall not be destroyed. It'll never be destroyed. That's why you want to stay in the church. Now, I'm not talking about the building here. We can change building, we can have a, you can have a little brush arbor out here and still have church. The church is God's people, it's the body of Christ. The body of believers, filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Baptized in Jesus' name. Having been filled with his spirit. That's the church. And you've got to stay in the church. You can't say, I'm going to go over here and do my own thing. I'm going to go out here and live like I want to live. Oh, I'm going to live for, it's going to be me, me and Jesus. Just me and Jesus. No, no, no. You want to be in the body of Christ because the body of Christ is what God has ordained that would be established forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. You and I are not guaranteed that, but the church is, if we stay in the church, God's got something great for us into eternity. Amen. And it's God's kingdom on this earth. Praise the Lord. It'll be that way until Armageddon. Now, I'm going to go back to Daniel here. I want to show you something in Daniel. Praise the Lord. Go back to Daniel for a moment. And... Uh, this is, uh, let's see if I can get back to it <laughs> myself. Okay, here we go, I think. Daniel 2, where he talks about, I'm going to read that verse of scripture again. And in the days, verse 44, this is 244. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, that's the church, which shall never be destroyed. And folks, I don't care what the devil does. 
And I don't care what nations will do. And I don't care what the world can do against the church. The church will never be destroyed. It'll survive and it'll stand strong. Praise the Lord. And there can be all kind of devils loosed and everything. The communist Russia, uh, the Soviet Union. I should say Russia because it was more than just Russia. It's the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union denounced that there was a God. They said, we believe in communism, and in communism, we believe there is no God. So we tell God to get out, out. Just get out and leave. Go, go away. And look at the mess there. They've been in all these years. It's, 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 you know, I was in, I was in Russia, I know, a number of years ago after, after the, uh, the Cold War was all over with. And I was there and everything. And some of those people were so glad they could still go back to church. And, and they've got, listen. They've got a people over there that's been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's all over Russia. They're called Urshanites. Old Andrew Urshan had gone over there and baptized a bunch of those people. And they went out and baptized others, and that church kept growing. Folks, there's a people all over this world, people all over this world that loves God, that's serving God. And God has made America great because America has been missionary-minded. And we don't ever want to lose that because that is the greatest thing in the world to God. His church. And he said it, Daniel, it'll survive when everything else goes down. And this, this, these kingdoms here, this, uh, this image here that I showed you. This is called the time of the Gentiles. Time of the Gentiles. It'll last for so long and then it's going to be over with. But the church will never be over with. God's body of believers will never be over with. Praise the Lord. Let me show you something. I'm going, I'm going here to Luke 21, 24. Luke 21, 24. This is where it talks about this, uh, this image here that Daniel saw. He's talking about the Jews now in 70 AD when it would, Jesus was prophesying about the Jews and how that they would lose Jerusalem and they would be scattered throughout the world. Look what it says here in verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. That's the Jews now. And shall be led away captive into all nations. And they were, 70 AD. And Jerusalem shall be trod down to the Gentiles. And they were. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This is the times of the Gentiles. This is a Gentile empire. This is what God showed Daniel to tell Nebuchadnezzar. You're that Babylonian empire, then the Media Persian empire. These were not Jewish empire. These were, these were uh, Gentile empire, the Roman empire. Now we're down here at the end where we are. Somebody asked me one time, said, where's American Bible prophecy? I said, I don't know of any particular place that it is. I know Rome is there and everything. They said, it's bound to be. We're such a great nation. He said, I said, all right, maybe it's the big toe on the foot. <laughs> which foot? Maybe it's the right one. I don't know which one. There's always been a separation here between that and that, and that period and the dark ages. And I'll talk to you in a minute about that. That's in your notes here. And we'll be looking at that in a minute. But I'm pointing out to you here, praise the Lord, that the Bible tells us here that this will happen until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled when it's all over with for the Gentiles. Now, let me give you another verse. You say, oh, Brother Myers, that's stretching a little bit, blah, blah, blah. Now, let me give you one in Romans here. This is Paul talking. That was Jesus speaking over there in, in uh, Luke 21. Now, look, here's Paul in 1125. In 1125, these are not in your notes. 1125, for I would not, brethren, that you would be ignorant of this mystery lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until, until. That's why the Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't believe that Christ has come. The word Jesus Christ, the word Christ is the Greek word for the word Messiah, which is Hebrew. Now, here's what it says. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in when it's all over with. And then when it comes in, 
that empire is going to be destroyed. Now, I'm going to give you one other uh, look here on the screen, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit from my heart. I got a. This is a, a timeline here. This is the Old Testament here. Old Testament. This is Adam. This is Calvary. Beginning of the New Testament here. This is the cross. This is the church age right in here. This is where we are. This is the rapture of the church right here. We are right here just before the rapture of the coming of the Lord. And following that's going to be the tribulation period and then Armageddon. Armageddon is that is, is this line drawn down right here. Now, if we were to take this image and lay him out here, this is where he would go from. He'd go from about 606 B.C., right here where my pen is pointing at, right about where the, the word years is A or R there, right in there. It would start right along about 606 B.C., and it would continue on to Jesus' coming, and then the Jews rejecting Christ, and then the Jews being scattered throughout the world, and then this church age period, all this is a time of the Gentiles. Now, God has used nations, listen to me closely now, God has used nations to advance his kingdom, has used them. Now, let me uh, go back to our notes here. I want you to look with me here. On number three here. God used them to advance his kingdom in the world. The Roman Empire, A. The Roman Empire. Paul and others preached the gospel all through these nations and established many churches. If you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that Paul went all over the then known world in that Roman Empire. In fact, the last place he finally went to was Rome. It's in the book of Acts. And he was carrying the gospel everywhere he went. God allowed the Roman Empire, not because the Roman Empire was such wonderful people, not because they were such great people, not because they were so special people, but because God wanted to use them to make it possible that a a guy like Paul that had no sword, no shield, nothing, just went out among the people and went from country to country, went from city to city, went to place to place and preached the gospel. And they just, the people got mad and yelled at him and they had, you know, and he, he, you know, some of them, they got mad at him here and there. But as far as a country being against him, it was not. And so they went on, they just preached the gospel. All through that Roman Empire, God allowed the gospel to be preached. Later on, and I'm moving very quickly here because I know I'm on a time frame here. Through the Middle Ages, this was done by various preachers and missionaries all through Europe. They, and I don't have time to go into it, but God blessed a nation here and there along the way. Whenever they had people in that nation who would begin to preach some measure of truth, if not all the truth. I'm moving on very quickly here. I'm going to see here. God used England in the 19th century. David Livingston went to Africa, carried the gospel over there, carried the gospel of Jesus Christ, began to preach there. Another one went to, went to India from England. England had its day. In which God, but God would bless those nations. He would bless them. They'd become powerful nations, big nations. And God would bless them because they were doing that missionary work out there, doing it. It's whenever they got to thinking, we are just a great special people. Nobody's like us. Nobody ever has been like us. It goes down. It goes down. It's not because there's anything special about England. Nothing, anything special about the U.S. Nothing so great about us. I know God has given us inventions and developments and we've been able to, to uh, you know, to use. I talked about the inventions last week. I think it was in my Bible study and so forth that America has been blessed with and all these kind of things. But, but folks, it's not that. It's because we have been mindful of missions. 
This is why the church never wants to lose your burden for the mission field. Thank God for the burden that our pastor has for the mission field. He has a burden for the mission field. And he's always trying to promote it, always doing something out there for somebody else, for another country somewhere. I'm just trying to point out to you here that God will keep on blessing as long as there is. Now, America is beginning to lose something. I want you to go to three real quick here, four. And my time's getting away. I got, I got a few minutes, so just hang on. In the 20th and 21st centuries, God has greatly used America to evangelize the world. And he has. And is still doing so today. A. But America's righteousness and respect for God is slipping. It is slipping, folks, from what it used to be. That respect for God is starting to slip. You begin to see it. They're trying to exalt things that should not be exalted. It's an abomination to the Lord. This thing about the gay movement and all that stuff. They're trying to lift all that up. That's, that's, that's an abomination to God. I can show you in the scripture. There's a lot of scriptures in it. I'm just pointing out to you here that we're stripping all those things, but because the church is still missionary minded, because we are still concerned about people over there, there are still people in the world that don't have food to eat. There are still places in the world where people are very poor. My my son, your pastor, was in a country over in Africa. Somewhere a few years ago, and he came back. He was brokenhearted about it. He told me about it. He talked about it all the time. About kids that was always trying to get water out of, a, out of the, uh, any puddle. They, they carried around a little, little bucket or something, trying to get water all the time. And they had leeches all in their things under their skin. And the missionary said, if you came back next year, half these kids would be dead. They just can't make it. Oh my, I feel so bad about it. So this world needs, still needs missions. I remember hearing about an orphanage that they started building and they just quit. And the guy that had been paid to do it walked off with the money. And all these kids had no more, no, no house. They had no orphanage. They had no building. They had nothing. They'd get up against a wall and on a rainy night, they'd get under 10 sheets of tin and try to stay out of the rain with sheets of tin all over them. And my son came back and told me all about it. And, and I felt so bad about it. One night I woke up in my, in my house. My wife was gone. She was up north at, at, with my daughter at, at uh, Harvard University doing some stuff. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I could hear it raining outside. And I said, God, I don't know about those kids over there, but I'm not, I'm not under a sheet of a tin. No, there's no piece of sheet of tin, the roof and tin trying to survive the water. And I promise you, when I get awake, I'm gonna send enough money over there to finish building that orphanage, and I did. I pulled money out of my bank account, and I went to the pastor, and I said, Liv, send this over there to those missionaries to build that orphanage. They did, and the orphanage was built, and now those kids have a place to sleep in. Now, I'm not the only one that does things like that. You do that. I know a bunch of you folks that have big hearts, but folks, the church can never lose the burden that we have to reach the world. And the world is also right outside our own door. Praise the Lord. And we've got to reach the world. Keep on sending missionaries. Keep on believing in it. Thank God. Because God has promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us if we would be faithful to his cause and to his purpose. But when it comes down to the end, and maybe, and I think that we here in America is right on down to the Right on down to the foot, as I mentioned, that guy where the, maybe the big toe or whatever, the toes. But it's time for the Lord to come back. And what I showed you in this uh, picture here is th this chart is that the rapture is coming soon. The Lord is coming back for his church. We shall be caught away meet the Lord. Then there's coming a tri tribulation period on this earth. That'll be a very short period of time. This is out of out of perspective it's only about 7 10 20 14 years nobody really knows how long but not very long right in here and then armageddon happened and armageddon is where the lord comes back with ten thousands of his saints we're caught away with the lord here we come back with the lord here with the lord at armageddon 
And at this point here, praise the Lord, God will defeat and this image, this Gentile empire here will be shattered, be hit on the foot and it will be shattered all the way through and it will mean nothing anymore and God will establish in the earth a thousand years of peace on the face of this earth. You and I will have the holy city in which we'll be living. And somebody asked me, will it be on the earth, over the earth, or way above the earth? And my answer to that is, I don't know. But wherever it is, I want to be in the holy city. Praise the Lord. So whether it's sitting on the earth, or whether it's just above the earth, or whether it's way up there like, like, uh, like the brightness, I know it'll be bright. Wherever it is, praise the Lord, we'll be there and we will be so special with God and God will have a place for us. Folks, oh, what God has prepared for the church. But he wants the church to be mindful that he still has people on the other side of the globe. I have a song book here and I've got, I just put these in here. This is a song book about America and uh it talks about old song. Look at this, listen to this. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her. This is a request that God look after America. Thank God that we sing songs like that. Yeah. Through the night, with the light from above, or the mountains, through the valley, it goes on and on. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America. My home, sweet home. And songs like that, that God had. Another one here, America the Beautiful. And it goes all the way through here talking about America, America. God shed his grace on thee. And he did. Praise the Lord. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Another verse says, America, America. God, mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control. Thy liberty in law and, and all these scriptures. And then I read one like this. And this is where you and I come in. God, and I'm thinking in our hymn books, we're still saying, thank you, Jesus. God bless America. Amen. And I'm so glad that our, our people back there, at the turn of the century, when the Holy Ghost was being poured out in the world, praise the Lord, folks. That Holy Ghost that was being poured out and people speaking in tongues, it went all over the whole world. It's still going all over the whole world. People are getting saved. It was a mighty revival. Started right here in America. And we are sending people still out there. And I'm reading this song. There's a call comes ringing. Or oh, the restless waves send the light. Send the light. You know it. There are souls out to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light, send the light, the gospel light, the, the, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, blessed God. Let it shine forevermore. And it goes on here with four courses like that. Every one of them are beautiful. But it's all about us sending the light to the world. Praise the Lord. This, of course, is a hymn. and It's in a hymn book. But I couldn't help but to thank God. You love America. You love your people. And you've given us the word here. And I'm going to read one of the last verse here, and this is in 2 Corinthians, and this is chapter 9, verse 6. And this is where we're going to conclude here at this time. This is our last verse right here. Right here, where my finger is. You see it? It's on your chart. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That's why people clap their hands when they receive the offering in this church. Did you know that? If you don't know it, that's why, that's why they do it. They're saying, I want to be a cheerful giver. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound. Toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to ever good work, every good work. Aren't you glad for God's goodness and grace to America? Aren't you glad that He has a plan how He will continue to bless us and help us? Folks, America's getting in trouble, but we're still sending the gospel out there. 
and God is still blessing and reaching souls. Let's stand together and let's just give him the thanks and praise him and ever be missions conscious. Praise the Lord. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for truth. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your people. Thank you for those that love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all of your many blessings upon us. Thank you for America, Lord, and what you have done for us in this country up to this point. We thank you, Lord, for your so many blessings upon us. Bless your people as we go from this place tonight. Keep your hand upon us and meet back with us again at the appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen.